Amid sunny orange groves, a dark cloud falls upon a rural family home. A 41-year-old mother is struck down by crippling illness, suddenly and swiftly. Her hair was gone. She weighed probably 90 pounds. Within days, two of her teenage boys are also in critical condition. Doctors find the family has been poisoned with a lethal chemical, thallium nitrate. It's a heavy metal that is not used in many things. It was a band rat poison. It interferes with everything in your body, gets in your brain, and there's no way to get it out. When death claims a victim, a massive investigation is triggered. To murder somebody by poisoning is exceptionally rare. It is something that has to be thought up. A very demented mind. This is no ordinary killer. The most diabolical criminal I had ever seen. He was a very evil, very devious person. A seasoned detective goes undercover at a murder mystery weekend devised by the suspect. One slip could cost her her life. I really took a deep breath and thought, has he seen me? He's not going to get in your face. He's going to poison you so that you die a slow, painful death. Drive far enough along Highway 60 into the heart of Central Florida, and you'll hit Alturas, a town of 500. Citrus groves outnumber people, 20 to 1. And there are lakes as far as the eye can see. Keep driving, and you'll come to a large clearing by the road, and a home where waitress Peggy Carr is beginning a new life. 41-year-old Peggy has spent many years as a single mom raising three children, Jelena, Alan, and Dwayne. We've seen all the heartbreak that she had, you know, gotten in her life that just made us more protective over. My relationship with my mom was um, a great relationship. Um, we uh, were very close, and that was very important to me. Um, she, was, um, she was exceptional. I just never seen my mom really in a bad mood. You know, she was always just full of life, it seemed like. Peggy's kids are thrilled when their mom meets Pie Carr, a phosphate miner. Here comes, you know, her knight shining armor. I was glad of their relationship. I was hoping that Pie was going to be the one. After a whirlwind courtship, Peggy and Pie tie the knot. I can remember she would tend to glow when she was that excited, that happy. And um, I thought it was um, a marriage made in heaven uh, for her. The couple has five kids between them, plus Peggy's granddaughter. They all move into Pies Alturas' home. Everybody seemed to really uh, get along well. My mother was happy, and she had the things that me and my brother always thought she deserved. Living in Alturas was great. We thought it was a, a paradise. But only six months after the wedding, trouble is brewing for Peggy and Pie. As the months went by, I started noticing my mom and him arguing more. On October 20th, Pie leaves on a hunting trip. Peggy stays at home with the kids and works some shifts at the restaurant. Three days later... She come home, she was having chest pain. She was talking about how bad her feet were hurting. I mean, they were just excruciating. And I was like, Mom, your feet always hurt, you know? You're, you're a waitress. And she's like, no, no, my feet are hurting. Within half an hour, Peggy is vomiting and in so much pain she can barely move. Pi returns home from his trip and his reaction shocks Peggy's son, Dwayne. Pi didn't want to take her to the hospital. Unable to convince Pi, Dwayne turns to his sister for help. I specifically remember my sister saying, no, I'm taking her, I'm taking her to the hospital. And he's like, no, 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 just, it's flu, it's a flu, it'll, it'll pass. Late that night, Pi finally relents. I physically picked her up out of bed because she couldn't walk and carried her to my sister's car because she was in agonizing pain. Doctors run a battery of tests. And couldn't find anything and released her. You know, she's still in agonizing pain. They give her some sort, sort of 
pain medication. Within three days, Peggy is back in the hospital, this time in the intensive care unit. She kept on getting worse and worse and worse. The doctors are baffled by her deteriorating condition, and whatever it is seems to be contagious. Both Dwayne and his stepbrother Travis are rushed to the hospital. We were both throwing up, super dehydrated. I never could eat anything. The pain that I had was unbearable. It was like a thousand needles just wrapped around your foot. Despite the pain, Dwayne's bigger worry is his mom. I remember waking up in the hospital, hysterical, what's going on? Where's mom at? Is she okay? Dwayne is wheeled up four floors to visit Peggy. He's unprepared for what he sees. Her hair was gone. She weighed probably 90 pounds. They had a cap on her. They didn't want to give me the shock of my life to see her laying there. She was able to write on a notepad, my feet hurt, my feet hurt. Dwayne's brother, Alan, has been away serving in the Navy. He takes a leave to be with his family. When I walked in and first seen mom, um, I hardly recognized her. Uh, she was real pale. Of course, there were tubes and things um, all over. And uh, I don't think that mom understood what was going on. Coming home to that was a shocker. Within a week, Peggy falls into a coma, and Dwayne and his stepbrother show no signs of improvement. There wasn't much that could be done, and we just had to pray. Doctors desperately seek the cause of the illness. Tests for common environmental contaminants are negative. They pursue a more radical possibility and make a startling discovery. In the bucolic town of Alturas in rural Florida, there's been a tragic turn of events for the Carr family. Struck down by sudden illness, Peggy is in a coma while her son and stepson are both fighting for their lives. I honestly thought I was gonna die. Doctors run every conceivable test and finally arrive at a shocking conclusion. I remember they said, yes, we know what happened. You've been poisoned. We were like, what? Poisoned? What do you mean? Did we eat something bad? The news is infinitely worse. Peggy and the boys have ingested an obscure and deadly substance, the heavy metal thallium nitrate. They said it was a band rat poison and colorless, tasteless. Was this poisoning simply a tragic accident or a more sinister crime? The sheriff's office is determined to find the answer. Certainly in the beginning, murder was not on our mind at all. But we knew something was obviously wrong. How did these people ingest? How did they touch? How did they inhale? I mean, we truly didn't know in the very beginning how this all came about. Susie Shottlecott, a local reporter, catches wind of the story. There was definitely a fear in the community and a concern. People were worried that their groundwater was contaminated. We checked the well water, think there was more than one house on that particular well. No one else was suffering any problems. Tests confirm the well is not the problem. Now they're going to determine what the source of that thallium was so they could put out an alert to everybody who lived in that area. We were looking at every possibility. Prosecutor John Aguero joins the investigation. With all of the groves we have is thallium in some sort of grove spray, insect control, whatever it might be. So they had to research all of that. From there, we asked the authorities, what are you doing? What they were doing was examining everything in the car household. We thought that it was something that they had probably eaten something they had drank. The sheriff's office swabs hundreds of items searching for the source of the contamination. They pretty much scoured the house from front to back. We found the Coca-Cola bottles had been tampered with, and someone had ultimately put thallium in the bottles and replaced the top. Coke laced with the odorless and tasteless thallium. This could be a case of product tampering and the beginning of a nationwide catastrophe. They had people down here who were scared to death to drink Coke. An investigation is launched. The initial step was to look at the bottling company and see what could have happened there. The Coke bottles don't come off one at a time and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're in a huge bunch of bottles that come down this thing and there's no way for it to have been contaminated at the plant. 
and then end up with all eight bottles having thallium in them. That's just not possible. It turned out it was product tampering, but it was at the home. It was not at the store or at the site of where they make Coca-Cola. It appears this was a targeted attack, a deliberate attempt to poison the family with a highly toxic chemical. Alan, Peggy's eldest son, is outraged. I didn't know who or how, other than it was um, a deliberate poisoning. Right away, I wanted somebody to pay for it. But who was responsible? When you start an investigation, everybody's a suspect. You have to rule out suspects. And certainly when Peggy was very sick and Pi didn't appear to be, obviously you think of him. But only six months into the marriage, could Pi Carr have a motive for poisoning his bride? Police learned that Peggy and Pi's relationship was rapidly deteriorating. I, I think he treated my mother horrible. I think he cheated on her. I don't think he was there enough. Just days before Pi left to go hunting, Peggy stayed with her kids in a local motel. I couldn't see that care and that concern in, in Pi. I mean, my mom was in the hospital. I don't remember him ever shedding a tear, ever, not one time. Dwayne tells the police he fears the worst. I thought that he poisoned my mother because he wanted out of the marriage. Pi Carr has a possible motive, and because he works in mining, he has access to this restricted chemical. Prosecutor John Aguero researches thallium poisoning. There are like hardly any reported cases of anybody using thallium. It's a heavy metal that is not used in many things. I, I'd never heard of it. Police bring Pi in for questioning, but they're thrown a curveball when Pi hands them a note he claims is from the real poisoner. I'm the one that got it from the mailbox, so I'm inquisitive, so I open it and uh, out comes this post-it that said, you and all your so-called family have exactly two weeks to move out of the state of Florida or you will all die. This is no joke. It's addressed to Pi Carr with Pi's unique name spelled correctly, which John Aguero finds significant. Had this note that was written to Pi Carr, P-Y-E, it's not spell it like a piece of pie. To write it like that was unusual, and whoever wrote this note knew that. Brought it inside, my mom immediately, you know, didn't think it was near as funny as I thought it was. You know, the kids were laughing and giggling, and, uh, oh, it's just somebody, it's just somebody down the street. She, uh, no, I'm taking it to the police, and she was very upset about it. But Peggy never takes the note to the police. Instead, it's shoved in a kitchen drawer. But why did Pi wait until now to bring the note up with the police? Is he trying to shift the focus away from himself? Her husband was a suspect, Pi Carr, obviously. Surprisingly, tests reveal Pi has thallium in his body, though he has not fallen ill. Pi was a suspect, but he had some of the coke himself. He could have taken a small dose to throw detectives off, but it turns out that almost everyone in the household drank some of the poisoned coke even if they haven't gotten sick. Is Pi Carr the wrong man? A sunny rural Florida town is the site of a dark and twisted crime. Soft drinks laced with thallium nitrate have been planted in the Carr family home. Peggy Carr's in a coma, and her son and stepson are fighting for their lives. Son Dwayne thinks his mom's new husband, Pi Carr, is responsible. I really thought that Pi done it. Though Pi has been the prime suspect, some things don't add up. The whole family, including Pi, drank the poisoned Coke. Everyone in the house had thallium in their system. And months before the poisoning, the family had received a threatening note that suggested they were all targets. Exactly two weeks to move out of the state of Florida or you will all die. Reporter Susie Shottlecott learns from the police that the poisoning of the car's household may not have been the first. Two of the car dogs died suddenly within a couple weeks of each other. And the way they died would suggest that they had ingested something. The dog had started losing hair. One of the symptoms of thallium poisoning. Was this a rehearsal for the poisoning of the family? In this idyllic rural community, who could want this family dead? An investigation starts from the center and works out, starts from the home and works out. Alturas is a very small community, a few hundred people. 
we started narrowing those people down too. I think interviewed every single person that lived in Alturas. No one in the community seems to have a motive. Police often turn to FBI profilers for insight. Mark Young has dealt with numerous cases of poisoning. The poisoner often feels like uh, that they've been wronged and wants to correct what they perceive as, as something that's been done to them or is aggravating them. The complexity of the crime helps narrow down the suspect list. The type of poison used was, was not something that you just go buy off the store shelf. So there's some level of criminal sophistication. Coca-Cola agreed to do some testing for the sheriff's department. There's only four, I think, thallium salts, and they introduced each of them into Coca-Cola, and only one of them would not discolor the product or make it bubble out of there faster than you could get the cap back on, and that was thallium one nitrate, and that's exactly what we found. That tells you that you're dealing with somebody that uh, has a high intelligence level. Whoever concocted this toxic cocktail knew what they were doing. As the investigation unfolds, Duane and his stepbrother are gradually recovering, but Peggy remains in a coma, barely clinging to life. I remember me thinking and hoping, you know, everybody tells you, uh, she can hear you talk to her, she can hear you. The doctors have a difficult conversation with the family. That it had um, progressed to the point that uh, she wasn't going to survive. She's not coming back. She's brain dead. It was time to take her off of life support. It wasn't her. She wasn't there anymore. We stood there by mom's bed. We kind of took a few minutes to say uh, goodbye. They uh, said that you're going to see her lungs inflate and deflate, you know, quite a few times, and then, uh, and then that's it. That's what happened, and she was gone. The car poisoning is now a homicide, but police still haven't identified a suspect capable of committing this well-orchestrated murder. To murder somebody by poisoning is exceptionally rare. It is something that has to be thought up in a very demented mind by a very brilliant person who thinks that they're smarter than everyone else. Police keep interviewing the locals and finally connect with the folks that live a heartbeat away from the cars, George Trapal and his wife, Diana. They discover there had been several confrontations between the neighbors over music played too loudly by the car teenagers. He comes around and, you know, uh, comes around the fence and, uh, I want to speak to your mother, I want to speak to your mother. And they had words, they weren't kind words. and. Peggy Carr tried to be conciliatory. Sorry, it's a little bit too loud. I'll tell him to turn it down. It won't happen again. And he just ranting and raving and cursing. And he even threatened to report the cars for renovating without a permit. We're going to turn you in. We're going to turn you in. Peggy had tried to be a peacemaker. Told us, you know, we have to live beside this man. He's not going nowhere. We're not going nowhere. We have to befriend this man. We cannot, you know, it's getting worse and worse and worse. The houses were very close together, so I'm sure that they could easily hear the music. There were just things that most neighbors encounter, really. Although the dispute doesn't seem like a strong enough motive, the proximity of the houses would give George Trapal easy access to the car home. There's nobody else around. I mean, it's just those two houses, and then there's nothing. People tend to notice strangers, and under intense police investigation, those details come out. And that stranger identification did not happen in this case. That tells us that the offender must be somebody that lives nearby. But who would ever suspect a poisoning over a neighborhood disturbance, over some kids playing a television or a radio too loud? Police interview George at his home. He tells them he doesn't know anything about chemistry or thallium. When they ask him why someone would poison the cars, he immediately states, perhaps to get them to move. The same message contained in the threatening note. Coincidence or something more? In Polk County, Florida, police scramble to find the person who killed Peggy Carr with poison. The 41-year-old mother drank an innocent-looking bottle of Coke but it was laced with a rare and deadly chemical, thallium nitrate. Peggy Carr suffered for months and months. 
While searching for the killer, police discovered that there was bad blood between the cars and their neighbor, George Trapal. We knew that he had a high IQ. We knew that he was a member of the Mensa Society. An exclusive social group for people who score 98% or higher on an intelligence test, which fits the FBI's profile of the offender. The more of that planning, the more of that sophistication you see, the higher you might think that this person's intelligence level is. You might also believe that this person has some type of grudge that that would have, um, the, the word I like to use is leaked somewhere in previous encounters with these people and even other people. Trapal is a software developer who claims to know nothing about chemistry, but that turns out to be a lie. We did a background on George Trapal and we knew that he was a chemist. George Trapal knew chemistry all right, a skill he used to make illegal drugs. George was involved in a methamphetamine ring in the 70s and we found out that he was ultimately arrested for that. There's one chemical this ex-con used extensively, thallium. It's considered a byproduct of a methamphetamine manufacturer. And while serving a few years in prison, George actually taught chemistry to other inmates. But investigators are a long way from proving George Trapal is their poisoner. When you have a good feeling that a person is, is responsible for a crime, you can't take that to court. More information was needed to pinpoint this as the right person. Police solve many homicides through interrogation, but decide that approach won't work in this case. Trapel was an intelligent person and, and an egotistical person and felt that he was smarter than the police. Grabbing a guy like that and bringing him in will only make him shut down. We also knew that he was introverted, that he was very quiet that he was not confrontational. Not the kind of person that's going to go man to man and speak to somebody. So you begin to look at uh, that poisoner as kind of a sneaky type of person. Can police outsmart the brilliant Trapal with their own cunning plan? This was not a traditional murder, so we had to use non-traditional investigative techniques. They bring in seasoned detective Susan Gorick of Special Investigations to run surveillance. I started looking through his trash. We were looking for any type of evidence that he may have discarded and possibly um, something about um, some type of chemical purchase. Day after day, Susan and her team observed George, hoping to gather evidence. And I was told to be careful because the person had a photographic memory. So if he saw us, that he could remember our cars or our faces. But nothing incriminating is found. Police fear that a suspected killer may go free. Who would if he had poisoned next? More than three months after the poisoning death of his mother, Peggy's son Alan has no answers. Overwhelmed by grief, he returns to the Navy. I didn't take it well. I got depressed. I got angry. I just, I couldn't handle it. Everybody's been poisoned. He's away, he can't do nothing. You know, he can't be the hero and, and you know, try to, to save us or find out what's going on. And Took all three of those bottles of Tylenol, climbed in my bunk and um, went to sleep hoping that, uh, um, you know, that I wouldn't wake up and that it would be over. At some point, someone found out what I'd done, and um, I, I woke up in the, uh, in the Navy hospital. The poisoning at the Carr household almost claimed another life, and the killer is still at large. The police decide to take a radical approach, an undercover investigation. And that's where Susan came in. Detective Gorick has a wealth of experience as an undercover cop, but there's a heightened risk in assigning her to the operation. I've been watching him for months, and I was scared to death that he had seen me and would all of a sudden put two and two together and realize who I was. We had to get information, so we chose who we thought would be the best undercover operative, and it was Susan. An opportunity arises to introduce Detective Gorick into George's world through his affiliation with Mensa, an organization for people with genius IQs. George Trapal and his wife were hosting Mensa Murder Mystery Weekend, and it was going to be a three-day event where they would simulate murders for the weekend and people could solve them. 
Detective Gorick develops an alias that will appeal to George Trapal. So we had studied his personality through the FBI with their behavioral scientist. Possibly this person has got some amount of uh, social inadequacy or cowardice, that type of thing. Since Mr. Trapal and his wife had a relationship where she appeared to be the more dominant one, the profiler suggested that I play up to Mr. Trapal's ego. Detective Gorick transforms herself into Texan divorcee Sherry Gwynn. The personality I developed for Sherry Gwynn was that of a victim, one going through a bad marriage. I wore different clothing than I normally would and a lot of costume jewelry. On a warm Florida day, Detective Gorick makes her way to the hotel hosting the event. I went into to register for the weekend, and the first person I saw when I walked in was George Trapal. Detective Gorick is now face to face with a suspected killer. The biggest fear that I had was that he had seen me when I was doing surveillance. I really took a deep breath and thought, has he seen me? And I looked for any recognition in his eyes. What will Trapal do if he recognizes Detective Gorick? In Polk County, Florida, George Trapal, a member of the high IQ group Mensa, is suspected of poisoning his neighbors, the Carr family, killing the mother Peggy. Four months into the investigation, police have launched an undercover investigation focusing on their prime suspect. We had to work into an environment where we could befriend him or create a relationship. Detective Susan Gorick has gone undercover to attend a murder mystery weekend hosted by George and his wife Diana. The first person she sees is George Trapal. The biggest fear that I had was that he had seen me when I was doing surveillance. I told him who I was, Sherry Gwynn, and that I needed to register. But George Trapal shows no sign of recognizing Gorick, AKA Sherry Gwynn. He handed me the registration package. Detective Gorick discovers that she has to juggle yet another identity, the character she's playing in the murder mystery. The name that he had assigned me was Roberta Putnam, a socialite from San Cristobal that dabbled in voodoo. Drinks are served and the game is on. There was over 40 people there. Participants are dressed up for their roles, everything from priests to CIA agents. There was a hooker, there was a voodoo priestess. George warms up the crowd with some jokes. He got up and told jokes about attorneys, and they were not flattering jokes. George really hated attorneys. Gorick hones in on George and puts this information to use. When he asked me about my background, I told him that my husband was a lawyer from Houston, Texas, and that I had left him and moved here. Will George buy her story? Talked about how he knew someone was lying by the way that their neck muscles moved. It made me very nervous. I kept talking and hoping that he wasn't using me as a test subject. To Gorick's relief, she seems to be connecting with George. He had a lot of ideas, and I just let him talk, and I played up to them. Suddenly, an announcement. The weekend's first make-believe murder has been discovered. It rather caught me off guard. And it's a poisoning. In staging this scenario for the game, was George Trapal drawing on personal experience? I found out that there had been a threatening note, and immediately my ears perked up because a threatening note. A background to the case written by George is even more chilling. One of the paragraphs that he wrote in this report said, when a death threat appears on the doorstep, prudent people throw out all their food and watch what they eat. Most items on the doorstep are just a neighbor's way of saying, I don't like you, move or else. The words are eerily similar to those in the threatening notes sent to the cars just before they were poisoned. When he talked about putting poison on a neighbor's doorstep, it, it really gave me chills. Gorick feels certain they're on the right track. After I read that, I knew that it was just not coincidence. Before the weekend wraps up, Detective Gorick has one last chat with George and his wife Diana, a doctor, and gains valuable information. 
George said that they were thinking about moving his wife's practice and that they would be selling their house. The detective seizes the opportunity. I told him that I was going to be looking for a house because my husband said he would buy me a house in our divorce settlement. George invites her to swing by for a visit. After I talked to my supervisors, they immediately wanted me to follow up. At a murder mystery weekend in Florida, Detective Susan Gorick has gone undercover in hopes of capturing a real killer. George Trapal, suspected of poisoning his neighbor Peggy Carr, has created a murder scenario for the game. Detective Gorick sees an uncanny parallel between the make-believe murder and the real-life crime she's investigating. When he talked about putting poison on a neighbor's doorstep, it really gave me chills. In her guise as Sherry Gwynn, a Texan divorcee, Detective Gorick has gained access to George's home. He's planning to sell, and she says she's in the market. Detective Gorick is hunting, but not for a house. Maybe he'd open a closet and I'd see lab equipment or maybe some chemicals or something that would give us enough evidence to get a search warrant for the house. Detective Gorick is alert for anything unusual. He did show me a small secret passageway that he had built into the library. Upstairs, he did have a mannequin that had some believe some bondage type things. Strange, but not grounds for a search warrant. It seems this mission is a bust. When I left the house, I thought that was going to be the end of the undercover role. But to Gorick's surprise, her bosses want to continue the covert investigation to see what else she can learn about George. FBI profiler Mark Young knows what's at stake. This type of person, if they really and truly develop a bond, if they feel that person is worthy, they might want to let them know about the crime. One time I met him at a park to have a picnic. She plays up the recent divorce of her alias, Sherry. I told him I just wanted to talk about my soon-to-be ex-husband. George is full of devious plans for revenge. One of the ideas he gave me was to ruin my husband's reputation because he was an attorney and send a letter saying that he molested a child. Over the next few months, Gorick, a.k.a. Sherry, has a series of lunch dates with George. Susan had to work into an environment where she could create communication, where she could create a bond, a friendship, in order to have any communications with him at all. George shares some surprising stories. He had told me about a road trip. They'd take Oreo cookies along the way, but they would pick up hitchhikers and feed them the cookies and there was hallucinogens in them, and they would watch the people hallucinate. While Susan is in the company of this nefarious prankster, a surveillance team monitors his every move. It was high stress every second for all of us, but it was certainly more high stress for her. I believe she was in great peril of uh, having her food or drink poisoned. Every time I left the table and came back, I would never eat or drink anything else. It's not someone that is aggressive and just shoots someone or stabs someone. They want to sit from afar and watch someone suffer. The longer you're next to somebody that is that dangerous, the, the more danger it is uh, to you. Before I would meet George Trapal, I'd have to go over in my head over and over and over again everything that I had told him. She has to live that role. That took a lot of mental gymnastics to go through. Your life could depend on you remembering everything. It's coming up a year since the Carr family was poisoned, but Detective Gorick hasn't had a break in the case. You may have many, many pieces of small evidence, but if you don't have the whole picture, you may not convict them. Some of the higher-ups are questioning the value of the undercover operation. Any type of law enforcement agency has budget problems, so certainly it was causing problems because they needed the personnel other, other places. So they had to be convinced why it was necessary to keep going. Just as her department is about to pull the plug, Detective Gorick learns that George and his wife are finally moving, months after she had originally viewed their home. She'd already moved her practice down to Sebring. So far, investigators haven't been able to examine George's house for evidence. There was not a search warrant issued earlier 
uh, because we didn't believe, we being the state attorney's office, that probable cause existed to get the search warrant. Susan Gorick has an idea that will get investigators into the home. In her undercover guise as Sherry Gwynn, she contacts George and asks if she can become his tenant. He said that was fine. In fact, he and his wife had already discussed it. And I sent him a rent check. As soon as Trapal deposits the check, Gorick has legal authority over the property. A team of detectives and FBI agents swarm the house. I took our crime scene section so that they could take swabbings from everywhere in the house. They're seeking any trace of thallium nitrate, the poison used to kill Peggy Carr. We immediately went there and searched everything, took all kinds of tests. Maybe he poured it down a drain, or maybe there would be some in the air conditioner. Some little things that they had picked up and it looked like they maybe they had some residue in it. Could the residue found in various bottles be thallium? What we were hoping was that in a few weeks we would get the results back. But Detective Gorick will have to wait much longer. We found out that there had been a federal bombing case, and the FBI, their priority right then was working on that case. With the clock ticking, Gorick decides to turn up the heat on George. I had George meet me at a um, little picnic area behind a McDonald's in Sebring. Surveillance video captures their meeting. How are you? Fine. How's your world going? Well, not real good, and that's what I need to talk to you about. Okay. I told him that I had had two detectives come and talk to me when I moved into his house. I think he neglected to tell me something. Oh, what's that? And I said that something happened in your neighborhood. Oh, oh yeah, somebody got poisoned next door. Said it was. That might not be a lot to you, but it's a lot to me. Oh. <laughs> Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> and he said he never caught the person that did it, and it, it really frightened me. He was being very flippant about it. Susan hands him business cards she says the detectives left behind. So I talked about the detectives that had come to talk to me and that they were trying to find him, and he started getting extremely nervous. How fast can you help me? You seem to be really interested in me. I really don't know what's going on. No, something just isn't falling in place here. I hope I'm not a prime suspect. <laughs> that could be messy. Uh, yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> and I knew right then. There was no doubt anywhere that he's the one that did it. Gorick is certain about George. But has George also drawn some conclusions about Gorick? He asks her more than once to come back to his new house in Sebring with him. So if you want a great tour of the house. Detective Gorick feels she's close to snaring George. She has no idea George has a similar plan for her. Detective Susan Gorick has spent the last year leading a double life. Her undercover persona, Sherry Gwynn, has befriended suspected killer George Trapal at considerable risk to herself. People like George, they don't get mad. They get even. At Detective Gorick's last meeting with George, he asked her repeatedly to come back to his house. So do you want a grand tour of the house? I'll be happy to give you a guide to. Has he realized his friend Sherry is actually a cop? I'll take a rain check on it. That rain check may have just saved Detective Gorick from a horrible fate. Susan could have very well been his next murder victim. But after 18 months of investigation, prosecutor John Aguero knows they still don't have a solid case. We just didn't feel there was enough to arrest him and successfully prosecute him. Gorick's last hope is that a vial recovered from the suspect's home will test positive for thallium, the poison used to kill Peggy Carr. I had really not concentrated on that at all because I knew, you know, that's like a needle in a haystack. After three long months, the FBI calls with the lab results. He said, Susan, they found thallium in it. I thought he was just kidding me. And he said, yes, they found thallium. I was just elated. Early the next morning, police descend on the Trapal residence in Sebring with a warrant for George's arrest. I was still not allowed to come out from being undercover. I had him on the phone while law enforcement knocked on the front door and spoke to his wife. FBI. He told me, oh, well, by coincidence, law enforcement's here. But I remember him saying, if you'll give me a few minutes, I have to put something on. 
Trapal's wife is taken for questioning, but she is not charged. Our investigation did not show Mr. Trapal's wife had knowledge of the crime. Authorities searched Trapal's new residence in Sebring. He had a set of very tiny screwdrivers, like jeweler's screwdrivers. We knew that the bottle caps had been pried off very carefully using a small tool. Those tool marks fit perfectly with one screwdriver that was missing in the jeweler screwdriver set. They had a poisoning guide. It told how to poison someone with Valium and what would happen to the body. They even find a reference in George's journal to getting rid of the neighbors. We found chemicals and chemicals and chemicals at George's house. Police look for a hidden room like the one in George's Alturas home. And finally, my lieutenant found a pegboard that had tools hanging on it and found a wall behind it with a door. Looked like a door to a dungeon out of a Boris Karloff movie. And he opened the door, and it was shocking. There's no inside door handle, and it was a freshly painted room. The only window in the soundproof space has been sealed. And there was a platform bed, and at the bottom of the bed were wood stirrups. He was building a bed on which to torture people. I, I was so shocked. He even had a pulley system to lift people. Detective Gorick got very weak in the knees and just had to be taken outside. And I was so glad that I had not gone. They might have not found me. She just saw herself as being the person George had built that for. It was very creepy, very creepy. Nine months after his arrest, George Trapal stands trial for the murder of Peggy Carr and the poisoning of her family. I called him the most diabolical criminal I had ever seen, thought that he had figured out the perfect crime and it almost worked. After four hours of deliberation, the jury returns a verdict, guilty on all counts. George Trapal is sentenced to death. He might have had a higher IQ than most of the world, but he certainly wasn't smarter than Susan. I was relieved because the family needed closure. Two teenage lovers run away together in search of freedom and adventure. He loved her a lot. He had asked her to marry him. He treated her very well, wanted to like protect her from everything. The young girl's anxious parents report their daughter missing, but are they too late? They were going to flee the state. Then we started really getting concerned. The couple's friends are in no hurry to help the police find them. The one thing we always did was we always backed each other's play. They never thought this adventure was going to end up the way it did. The young man found brutally bludgeoned to death along a railway track. It looked like somebody had just been brutally beaten about the head. The 16-year-old girlfriend vanished without a trace. Who did this? If she was with someone else, this would be against her will. My biggest fear for her at this point is that she is dead. Smack in the middle of Florida is a land of horse ranches, small towns, and trains. Lots of trains. Many of the freight cars traveling these tracks are full of orange juice from the fertile sunshine state. But it's along these tracks that a train crew makes a grisly discovery. Marion County Sheriff's Captain Patty Lumpkin is on call that day. When we got there, we see the body of what appears to be a young male, maybe in his late teens, early 20s, blood around the head area. You could tell by looking at him that he was dead. And the first thing I do is make sure that we've got our forensics people on the way, our medical examiner on the way, 
and all of the investigators that we have called out are either there or en route. Lieutenant Jeff Owens is one of those officers. When those type of things happen, it could be someone who might have fallen off a train or someone who could have been struck by a train. But on closer inspection... It didn't appear to be an accident because if he had been hit by the train, the trauma would have been much more extreme. I've seen some deaths from trains, and the initial impact of the train would have done more harm to the body. There were facial injuries consistent with falling forward, and there were marks on and about the head indicating blunt force trauma. The authorities, including forensic officer Mike Dunn, carefully surveyed the surrounding area. We did see a uh, baseball type of cap, and it appeared to have blood on the inside surface of the bill. In addition, there was a pair of wire-rimmed uh, eyeglasses, and one of the earpieces was missing, and one of the lenses was out. This didn't look good either. Police are beginning to fear they have a brutal homicide on their hands. As we began to move in a little bit closer, we saw that the victim had been dragged to that spot using just the blue jean material around the cuff at the ankle. There was some tall grass. And if you can picture in your mind something being pulled along through the tall grass. The grass was pushed down and squished and pressed down by the dragging of the body. It was almost as if the person who did him harm may have been trying to hide the body, but for some reason didn't complete the task. Also in plain view is what appears to be the source of the victim's lethal injuries, a brass and rubber coupling used to link one train car to another. One of those metal ends had spots of what appeared to be blood on it. We make sure that they bag the hands. Any DNA under the nails or any kind of transfer of fluids or anything from the, the perpetrator to the victim is very critical. There might be hairs, there might be fibers from a shirt or sweater that we could find, and we don't want to lose that. While Mike makes a sketch of the scene, police search the young man's body. He had some jewelry, a watch, a necklace, a small amount of cash. It was not a robbery. So then again, you go back to how did that person wind up in that area, and what was the relationship between the train and that person? In order to answer that question, investigators must first determine who that person is. In this particular case, we did not find any identification on the body. But police do find something in his pocket they hope can help. There was a receipt where some money had been wired from Illinois to Florida. The name on the receipt is a woman's, Wendy. Who is she? And what connection might she have, if any, to the dead young man? Was she involved? Was there someone else with her? Is she safe? Is she a missing person that something may have happened to her? Can she tell them the identity of their murdered male victim? In their search for answers, police tracked the $200 wire receipt back to its point of origin, the Chicago suburb of Woodstock, Illinois, where Officer Kurt Rosenquist has been investigating the disturbing disappearance of a 16-year-old girl named Wendy. Most of the juveniles that we've dealt with in Woodstock, they will go away for a few hours, come back late, or they'll be gone for a couple days. But Wendy and her 19-year-old boyfriend, Jesse Howell, have been missing for more than a month. And police fear the pair may have left the state. With kids that age, they can meet with the wrong crowd, they could get rolled for money. They can get into all kinds of trouble. All of which makes him anxious for any news of the missing pair. But the disturbing call from the Florida investigators only fuels Rosenquist's worst fears. They advised me that they were investigating a John Doe unidentified body involving a younger male. Rosenquist sends Jesse Howell's fingerprints and photograph to Marion County Detective Jeff Owens. He said he would hopefully be able to have a positive identification on the unidentified male subject by the end of the day. A teenager is found dead along a railway track in Florida. He has been savagely bludgeoned to death. 
investigators trace a receipt found in his pocket to Woodstock, Illinois, where police have been investigating the disappearance of a 16-year-old girl named Wendy and her boyfriend, Jesse Howell. The star-crossed lovers had run away together to start a new life. Is Jesse the dead young man? And if he is, what has become of Wendy? Was she involved? And if so, we needed to find her to try to determine what exactly happened to Jesse. Jesse and Wendy had met just months earlier, but the young man knew a good thing when he found it, according to best friend Justin Canary. He was starting to look for, you know, girls that will treat him how he treats them and that kind of stuff, you know. Jesse really, really cared for her and Wendy was very important to him. And a good influence on the young man. She didn't, you know, smoke or drink much, you know. She was like a down-home country girl. She wasn't much of a troublemaker like we were. Trouble was something of a companion for Jesse Howell, who'd already had more than one run-in with the law, much to the dismay of his mother. He was just hanging out with some very unsavory people that had made really bad choices, and he had a habit of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But beneath Jesse's bravado... He was somebody that would do anything for anybody that needed it. But he was also somebody that wasn't really world-wise. He wasn't street-wise. And he trusted too quickly. And when he loved somebody, he loved completely. That was certainly the case with Wendy. We knew that he had asked her to marry him. And we knew that he loved her a lot and that he really felt this was the one. The young couple secretly got engaged and on February 23rd ran away to start a new life together. He had a few hundred dollars saved up and he bought this old beater car. And at the time he did not have a valid license or insurance, but he had a friend that did. And so the friend decided he and his girlfriend would go with them and the friend drove the car. It was tough. It didn't feel like he was ready to be on his own. I was terrified, absolutely terrified. We called his friends everywhere we could think of to find out if they knew where he had gone. But Jesse's friends aren't talking, despite what they know. He told me that he was going to Florida. Jesse was my best friend. I was going to go with him, for sure. Then some things came up, and I was like, I can't go right now. You know, go ahead and go, you know, send me a postcard. When Wendy's parents discovered their daughter missing, they called police. But even Rosenquist can't get the pair's friends to spill the beans. Because that was going to interrupt this little escapade and adventure that Jesse and uh, Wendy were going on. And they felt that uh, any information that they provided to us that would jeopardize their close-knit friendship. The one thing we always did was we always backed each other's play. So when the missing persons report got filed, Everyone said they didn't know anything. We wanted them to be happy, so we all thought we were looking out, you know, for what's best for Jesse. In the days following, Jesse's mother waited for word from her only son. We got phone calls from him, very few phone calls, but he did call. It seemed the foursome had made it as far as Florida when things started to sour. The other couple. I guess they were getting tired uh, and frustrated with Wendy and Jesse having so many arguments that they decided we're just going to leave them. So when Wendy and Jesse went into the truck stop, the other couple took off in the car. At the time, they thought that leaving them there, they'd be fine. Just three weeks into their trip, and the teen's romantic dreams had given way to hard, cold reality. We were advised by Wendy's parents that Wendy had contacted them saying that she wanted to come home and asked if they could send some money. It was at that time that Wendy's parents, Western Union, $200 for Wendy and Jesse to pick up so they could take a train or a bus home. Three days later, Jesse called his parents to let them know he was on his way back. We felt so encouraged. He was going to come home and face up to everything and get his life back on track. It felt, it was relief. He realized that he needed more than just what he was capable of doing at that point. We offered to send a train ticket and he said, no, it was okay. And that was the last I heard from him. He told me he loved me 
and that was it. Though the pair collected the $200 sent to Wendy for their return trip. Checking with Greyhound and the different train stations, uh, nobody matching their description ordered buses or trains back to the Woodstock area. Now, a week and a half after the teens spoke to their parents, Rosenquest is waiting to learn from Marion County investigators whether the beaten body found by the Florida railway tracks is that of Jesse Howell. About 5 o'clock that afternoon, Detective Owens gave me a phone call. They had made a positive identification that the unidentified subject was, in fact, Jesse. Kurt Rosenquest prepares for the part of his job he hates the most. Death notifications to family members when it's somebody old or had some health issues is one issue, but when it's a homicide, it makes it even harder. He said that Jess had been found along the railroad tracks in Florida and that they had identified him and they, had, they were sure it was Jess. The next train going through had seen him and that he had been killed by blunt force trauma to the head. But Becky Howell continues to hold out hope that the murdered teen is somehow not her son. We never got to see him, so it's very hard to have closure. I talked to Patty Lumpkin about it. At the autopsy, crime scene investigators always take a lot of photographs. So we cleaned up the photograph, the neck up, and sent it to Becky and said, is this Jesse? That was very hard. I cried. He was, he was just laying there, and it was him. And that put the nail in it. It was, that's it. That's him. I know there was shock and grief. They never thought that this little adventure road trip that Jesse and Wendy went on was going to end up the way it did. And of course, then they were also very concerned where Wendy was. There was nothing that was going to bring Jess back. And there was no sign of any kind of violence that would have happened to her. There was nothing. And we just knew somehow Jess was dead and Wendy was gone. Lumpkin and Owens step up their search for the missing teen. We weren't sure if Wendy had been kidnapped, abducted, or if she ran away further because of some issues between her and Jesse. So the correlation between her and the crime scene was critical, finding her. Police use helicopters to scour for miles in all directions, and officers on the ground do a grid search. You're all walking, you know, shoulder to shoulder with the arm's length between you. There's nobody just walking around, because any time you do that, you can trample on evidence and you can destroy your case. But they find nothing at the scene that leads them to the missing girl or the young man's vicious killer. We don't have that person's hair, DNA, fibers, blood, uh, nothing of that other person that was there. We don't have that. Even though we knew that we had the body of Jesse Howe, I think the critical thing at that time was where was Wendy? Marion County, Florida investigators have a double mystery on their hands. Who bludgeoned 19-year-old Jesse Howell to death, then left his body beside a railway track? And what has become of his 16-year-old girlfriend, Wendy? We need to know, is she okay? That's the critical question. Police comb the surrounding area, but find no sign of Wendy or any clues as to the identity of Jesse's killer. It's difficult enough for Jesse's family to deal with this situation. But it's doubly difficult because Wendy's family doesn't know what happened. Nor do investigators. Did a suspect kill Jesse to get Wendy? Did Wendy and Jesse have an out and Wendy somehow hurt Jesse? She may have just fled the scene or left the area. Whether she was on her own, we don't know. She and Jesse were in love with each other. They were committed to each other. And so if she was with someone else, it seemed to me by all things that I had learned that this would be against her will. News of the young man's tragic fate quickly makes its way to the couple's friends. I, I remember hearing the phone ring, my sister talking on the phone, and then she, she, hung, up, she hung off the phone and came downstairs, and she told me to sit down. I was like, oh no, you know, something bad happened. And my, then she started crying. 
you know, she, and all she had to say was, you know, his name. She couldn't even finish the sentence, and I knew right away. And Justin's grief is compounded by haunting guilt. There were things I could have done. What if I could have, you know, talked him out of it? What if I, you know, what if I had stopped him from going? I could have saved him, you know. Now investigators are determined to find Jesse's girlfriend. Police and volunteers paper the southeastern United States with posters and distribute flyers along the Florida to Illinois route. We also try to do it through the truckers network because there are a lot of truckers there and they see a lot of things. You know, they're a great avenue of information for you. And police return to the tracks. Might a homeless rail rider have seen something that could help solve the case? Investigators enlist the help of the railway authorities. There's a very well-defined railroad police network in the United States. They have a reputation of being very well in tune with the homeless population. And they start talking to some of the transient people that live there among the tracks in what they call their hobo camps. In the meantime, Florida and Illinois police investigate every sighting of a young woman matching Wendy's description. One of the sightings was that she was living in an abandoned house that one of her old friends had been living in, so we did a search of this vacant house. There were a lot of rumors flying around. You know, this, uh, she's here, she's there. Somebody said she'd been seen at a Marilyn Manson concert. People said, oh, I got a phone call from her. And there were phone calls out in Nevada, out in Colorado that we had to follow up on. Those were all found to be uh, false leads. It was starting to get frustrating as the case dwindled on and information was not coming in. And with a killer on the loose, the Marion County community is growing frustrated too. When you have an unsolved homicide, then the people that live in that area always wonder, is there someone among us? You know, who did this and how could it happen in our area? Then on June 4th, two and a half months after Jesse's body was found, Wendy's parents receive a phone call that promises an end to the parents' harrowing nightmare. The phone rang and Wendy's father answered the phone. The girl was crying, I said she wanted to come home, she's really sorry, I love you. She tells the father she's in Illinois, two hours south of Woodstock in the town of Kankakee. She was at a gas station. She's using a pay phone. He asked her, where's this gas station? She said she didn't know where the gas station's located. He asked her if there was a phone number on the pay phone. She said there's no phone number on this pay phone. Then the phone call ended. Although investigators aren't certain the caller was Wendy, they can't afford to take any chances. If she had been held captive, she could have gotten loose, or she may have had that one opportunity to make that phone call. Let's get to her right away. And there is more riding on her rescue. Now maybe we have Wendy as a witness to Jesse's death, and we'll be able to assist Marion County on getting the homicide resolved. But first, they need to find out where that phone call was made. Then, go to that point, see if anybody actually saw a girl fitting Wendy's description there. The next morning, I made arrangements to go down to Kankakee to start searching the gas stations for any witnesses or evidence that she was down there. When Rosenquist finds no one who remembers seeing a girl matching Wendy's description, he begins a systematic search of the town's gas station payphones, looking for ones with no posted number. All of them had the phone number prominently displayed right above the keypad on the telephone, um, except for one. Was this the location from which Wendy made her frantic call? After searching for months, investigators may be close to finding the 16-year-old girlfriend of murdered teenager Jesse Howell. I hope it's true. I really hope it's true. I hope that she's been out there. Her parents received a frantic phone call from a young girl they believe is their daughter, Wendy. Now police have tracked down surveillance video from a gas station where they think the call was made. I started viewing the video and I observed a female subject that physically resembled Wendy. I wasn't going to say 100% that it was her, 
but it was right at the time frame that the phone calls being made. They showed the tape to Wendy's parents. So when Wendy's mom said it was definitely her and there was other family members thinking it was her, we had to treat it as a bona fide sighting. It means we've got another lead that we've got to find Wendy, that the possibility of her being alive is great. Our hopes were really high at that point. This would be wonderful if somehow Wendy had made it back to her home state. And so the feelings at that point were guarded optimism. As a result of this video, we subpoenaed the phone records of Wendy's parents to make sure that this phone call was made from that gas station. When investigators receive the information five days later, their hopes are dashed. It indicated that the phone calls made to Wendy's parents did not come from that phone at the gas station where we had retrieved the video. Uh, it turned out it came from a different gas station and it had the flyers that we had posted. Desperate for news of their daughter, Wendy's parents had added their home number to the posters. Keep in mind that Wendy's parents were extremely stressed through this whole ordeal. Uh, that sometimes can skew a person's view or actually uh, hearing a voice on the phone, things of that nature. Unfortunately, it seemed like this was a very cruel prank or joke being played on Wendy's family. Police believe it was someone pretending to be Wendy who had called the parents from one gas station. While across town, a girl resembling Wendy had coincidentally entered the gas station convenience store. Investigators are shocked by the callousness of the caller. How somebody could be so cruel to make a phone call to a family member, pretend that it's your daughter who's been missing for months. I can't fathom someone who would play a prank like that and get the parents hopes up it, and in my vision it's disgusting can imagine putting myself in that place saying that uh, I've got someone missing and all of a sudden they're calling they're crying help me and you have no earthly way of helping them you can't get to them you don't know where they're at uh, all of a sudden they're gone again and then your life is shattered one more time that's a cruel roller coaster ride as more months pass without any sign of Wendy, investigators grow increasingly disheartened. Our detectives would keep case files and case books. So the books were always in front of you with the, the name of the homicide victim on the spine. So you always had that in front of you somewhere. It's frustrating when you don't solve a case rapidly. And the colder a case may get, the harder it is to solve. It is generally up to you on how to deal with that frustration. Do you shrug and, and give up? Uh, I don't think we ever really give up. Jeff Owens almost became my best friend. I drove them crazy. I drove Patty Lumpkin crazy, I'm sure. I was constantly calling them, constantly calling the offices. We needed to know what was going on. We needed to know if Wendy had been found. My biggest fear for her at this point is that she is dead. And I think that's a possibility because more time goes by and you've not heard anything and you have no clues that are solid. We were hitting a brick wall at that point. A year passes with little progress. Hopes of finding Wendy are beginning to fade. Then, investigators receive a call from the railroad authorities with a very promising lead. Near the town of Jacksonville, we got word that one of the homeless guys mentions, I know a guy named One-Legged Bob who is traveling with a girl and could very well be responsible for the murder of her previous boyfriend. 16-year-old Wendy has been missing for more than a year, and the investigators who've been tirelessly searching for her have run out of leads. You always hope for the best, but as they say, you prepare for the worst. They return to the railway tracks, where they learn that a hobo with a criminal record and the nickname One-Legged Bob is rumored to have been involved in killing Jesse Howell and may know Wendy's whereabouts. This is an extremely important lead for us. We've got to find who One-Legged Bob is, and does he have a girl with him? 
but how to track an elusive hobo. We did a lot of research on him. We tried to determine what sort of past he had. One nigga Bob did have a criminal record. I think his traveling, his transient uh, life was something that would be a possibility for someone to be involved. Police once again enlist the help of the railway authorities. It was just a matter of weeks before they called me right back and said, Jeff, we found one-legged Bob. Do you want to talk to him now? Owens quickly makes his way to Pensacola, Florida to talk to the potential killer. One-legged Bob was your typical, what you might consider a homeless person, kind of scruffy, hadn't shaved in a few days. And he had a prosthetic leg that helped him get around. So for someone who you might consider crippled, he was far from crippled. And well capable of the murder of Jesse Howell. I spent the next seven and a half hours interviewing him about what knowledge he had of this case, how involved he may or may not be. It was exhaustive. Have police finally found the person responsible for Wendy's disappearance and Jesse's murder? Throughout this lengthy interview, he didn't trip, he did not falter. It's a series of those type of moments that a seasoned investigator will start to get the feeling and the confirmation that I'm dealing with the wrong guy. We really couldn't connect him to her. There was nothing we could do except release him. Investigators are deeply disappointed in their inability to solve either case, and they're not the only ones. For us, it was horrible. It was excruciating, but we knew where our son was. We knew what had happened and where he was, and they had absolutely no idea where their daughter was, and that's got to be horrifying. If I didn't know where one of my daughters was for years, didn't know if she was alive or not, that would, yeah, that would, that would tear me up. I know Wendy's, Wendy's mom uh, held out hope for a, for a long time, but yeah, we all hoped that she was still alive. We all hoped she was going to make it home. Two years after Jesse's murder and Wendy's disappearance, Patty Lumpkin is in Quantico, Virginia, attending a coveted three-month training program with the FBI. The privilege of that was great because less than 1% of law enforcement in the United States have that opportunity to attend that academy. Little does she know that her effort to become a better cop will blow her unsolved homicide case wide open. Lumpkin hears from officers attending the course about a murderer on the loose in Texas. I became aware that they were looking for someone that was dubbed the railway killer, the angel of death. He was killing people and either leaving them near the railroad or he was killing them at homes or locations that were close to the railroad. The FBI believes the railway killer's real name is Angel Resendez, charged years earlier for a rash of burglaries across the U.S. But more recently, police had matched his fingerprint to one of a slew of murders, all with the same grisly signature. Most of the victims were bludgeoned to death. It was blunt force trauma. That M.O. is so strikingly similar to that of Jesse's ruthless killer, Lumpkin has the growing sense she's on to something. They're looking for him out in the West. We're in the South, but remembering that the possibility of the mobility of the train, you know, what's the chance? Could Resendez be the man for whom they've been desperately searching for years? Lumpkin and Owens quickly head to Texas, the site of the railway killer's most recent attacks. They were having a meeting to discuss the possibility that this person of interest was involved in a serial crime spree around the country. And he's a difficult killer to catch, according to profiler Mark Young. We knew Angel Resendez was a person that rode the rails across the country. We were worried about where he was going to strike next. So we had made the decision early on that he needed to be made a top 10 fugitive. You know, these millions of eyes from the public would tell us something. The strategy works, and Resendez is apprehended along the Mexico-Texas border. 
He is charged and convicted of one gruesome killing, and he's the number one suspect in dozens of others. He was one of the most vile, um, like evil persons that I had dealt with. It was like every time you turn around, here's another murder. Might Jesse Howells be one of them? Was Resendez responsible for Jesse's death and Wendy's disappearance? Owen and Lumpkin want to interview him and find out. So to be able to talk to him in person, uh, you can sit one-on-one -on -one with him and you can look him in the eye and hope that he will give you that information. But there's a problem, and it's a big one. The attorneys representing him at the time in Texas stopped us. They wanted to protect their client from talking. And any defense attorney who represents a criminal will generally tell the person, stop talking to law enforcement. And with Resendez on death row, the investigators know they're quickly running out of time. The state of Texas historically has a pretty fast moving execution rate. So we were concerned that Resendez would be put to death before we resolved our case. That's when Lumpkin and Owens hit upon an idea. We contacted some folks in Houston and asked them what opportunity we might have to communicate with Resendez in jail by letter. He gravitated towards females more than he did the males from what the detectives out there were telling us. So I wrote the letter. We treated him uh, respectfully in the way we wrote the letter. We even referred to him as senor instead of mister because that's, that's appropriate for someone from Mexico. We just laid it out. We have a case that's open where we have a young man that was killed. He was traveling with his girlfriend and we never found her. And we just bluntly asked him, was he involved in the cases? Did he know what happened? And much to our surprise, he responded. Marion County Police are in a hurry to meet with Angel Resendez, the man they believe is responsible for the Florida murder of Jesse Howell and the disappearance of his girlfriend, Wendy. He was on a path to a death penalty in Texas. We didn't have a lot of time. Given the court order preventing them from meeting with the so-called railway killer, investigators write Resendez hoping he'll come clean on the crime. And much to our surprise, he responded by saying he knew all about it. As a matter of fact, he was quick to admit that he was the one responsible for killing Jesse. It is a shocking admission. Can they trust Resendez to be telling them the truth? There have been cases in the past where people falsely confess to a crime. One of the ways to prevent that is not to release all information. One of the most crucial and important aspects of this case was that we had never talked about the murder weapon. Can Angel Resendez provide police with the information only the killer could know? He described the brake coupling that he had hit Jesse in the head with. He knew that. We knew absolutely at that point we hit the target. The investigators are elated. Though they have yet to meet Resendez face to face, they are confident they have found Jesse's killer. But what about Wendy? Does he know what happened to her? We need to be able to sit down one-on-one -on -one with him to talk with him and find out, is he gonna talk to us? Is he gonna tell us what happened? To be certain he's not lying to them, the investigators are prepared to offer Resendez a deal. But first, the heartbreaking task of asking Wendy and Jesse's parents to agree to it. At that point, we went to the families and we said, may we give this killer immunity from prosecution in Florida if he agrees to talk to us? It is not an easy question to ask a family, uh, okay, we're going to give this person a pass if they tell us what happened. But the long and short of that was that he was going to be executed in Texas. And to be able to give some closure, they agreed to that. To investigators' relief, so does Angel Resendez. As twisted as it may sound, he might have been proud of some of what he did. It was another veiled attempt to earn a little more infamy, make himself feel famous. Uh, would we take advantage of that to get him to talk? Sure we would. Lumpkin and Owens head to death row in Texas for one of the most difficult interviews of their careers. 
pressure was great because we knew that this was our one shot. If we didn't do it right, we would never know what happened. The entire case is basically hinging on what he's able to provide. When we get to the prison, we see him coming down the hallway. He has a waist belt on that's an electric shock belt, and he's chained to the belt. All for what appears to be just a regular guy. He's just a, a mild-mannered person, but remembering, too, that a psychopath or a sociopath doesn't have any feeling. I mean, he had dead eyes. He had no feeling in that body. He didn't care about anything. Resendez tells investigators that he was heading south to find work when he met the runaway couple on a grain car. When the freight train stopped and Jesse got off to smoke a cigarette... Resendez told us that he killed Jesse with a piece of the train coupling. And that Wendy was, I believe, asleep on the train when this took place. And then when they went down the road further, Somehow, he talked Wendy into getting off the train. He claims he strangled Wendy to death, then dragged her lifeless body into the bushes. He talked about covering her body with a army-style jacket. He talked about a book that she had been carrying in her backpack. Uh, you got to remember, this was three and a half years prior to this interview, and he so vividly recalled so many of these details, it was sort of spooky. But is he simply leading on the investigators? There was a great chance that even though Resendez told us where he left Jesse, that he was lying about Wendy. There's only one way to find out. While we were sitting there during our interview with Resendez, we asked him, would he draw us a more detailed map? On the map, he drew where the bodies were. He drew where Wendy's body was. After confessing that he'd murdered Jesse Howell and his girlfriend Wendy, Angel Resendez, known as the Railway Killer, has drawn police a map of what he claims is the location of the 16-year-old girl's body. But investigators are leery. We didn't know if it was going to lead to us discovering her remains. And not only could he be lying, but he could maybe not know exactly where he did leave her. Three and a half years after Wendy went missing, police returned to the railway tracks in search of her body. Using Resendez's map, investigators travel an hour's drive south from the site of Jesse Howell's murder. We had gone down the tracks a pretty good distance when you could see, based on the description that Resendez had provided um, of this big cluster of trees like a canopy, and there was a white farmhouse close by. And we had a big team ready on the ground, and we had some very uh, highly trained dogs to help us. Very shortly after the dogs began their search that they found a campsite. During the interview at Death Row, Resendez talked about the book. The book was there. We talked about the jacket, the big heavy army style overcoat. It was there. All of these things were there. And police don't have to dig very deep to find Wendy's body. It does break your heart because you know that she is somebody's loved one. She's not just a young girl. She's somebody's loved one. She had a future. Now she doesn't have a future. So it's not a good conclusion, but it's the right conclusion to find for the family. We were grateful for the relief that Wendy's parents would be able to go through now. We knew they would finally be able to grieve their daughter and move on with their lives. When Wendy ran away, um, she had a small engagement ring and she had a Winnie the Pooh wristwatch. Um, during the excavation of the remains and the processing of the crime scene, the ring and a Winnie the Pooh watch were located and um, I brought those back to Woodstock and gave those to Wendy's parents. Jesse had this, it was just a little like pewter cross that he wore all the time. And um, it was actually on, on his body when, when, they, when he was found dead. And his, his mom gave it to me and I still have it to this day. And it's just one of those small reminders, you know, of, you know, to, to be aware of the decisions I make in my life. There will never be closure. There's no such thing as closure. It's always going to hurt. 
Every March 23rd, I'm going to cry. But it's huge to know that it's done so that you can at least say it's done and move on. In the years following, federal agents continue their investigation into the railway killer. They discover a bloody trail of no less than 15 brutal murders throughout the United States. Angel Resendez is executed in Texas by lethal injection. A horrifying discovery. The body found in a quarry. Shot in the back of the head and dumped there. The investigators stumped. It's not only a who done it, it's a who is it. Where do you start? The victim, a middle-aged man with a mysterious past. He was very secretive. They'd met him at coffee shops. And a shadowy lifestyle. This is a lot bigger than the landlord really thinks it was. The missing housemate. Is she a witness? Is she a victim? Was she alive? The friend who's disappeared. Shivers went down my back. Oh my God, we have a possibility of three victims. Is this gruesome attack just the beginning? Did someone from organized crime come in and kill him? Investigators hope science can help solve the crime. We could see the section of the carpet had been removed. It was blood. It was an amazing forensic puzzle. There was 10 beautiful fingerprints. But will the killer get the best of them? Who actually pulled the trigger? We had a genuine mystery on our hands. It was going to be a long, hot summer. Falls, one of North America's most spectacular natural attractions, draws more than 12 million visitors a year. On this May long weekend, a holiday, tourists swarm its banks. Less than an hour away, seven teenagers enjoy much calmer waters. Allison Schoenfeld and her friends are hanging out at the Wayne Fleet Quarry, the watery remnants of an old cement factory just north of Lake Erie. We were excited to go spend the weekend together and throw ourselves off bridges. Hot summer temperatures are still a month away, but that doesn't stop the teens from bridge jumping. It was pretty shocking to jump in to such cold water, so we definitely swam to the side and got out as quickly as we could. While on the quarry bridge, they spot an intriguing object just below the water's surface. We were looking down at this bag, and it had U.S. on the top in big black letters, so we thought maybe it was a mailbag, or maybe it had money in it, or maybe it had a dead animal in it. And then somebody said maybe it had a dead body in it, and we all laughed. But what they will discover is no joke. When we were pulling it out, we were commenting on we couldn't believe how heavy it was. As we were pulling it up, the water around the bag just came up and it turned all red. And that's when we knew it was, in fact, someone that was dead in the bag. Horror struck. The teens flagged down a passing motorist who calls police. We just couldn't believe what we had just found. Donna Moody can believe it. She's head of the Niagara Police Force's major crime unit. We were busy. We'd had two unsolved homicides, and uh, we, we are working continually on, which takes a lot of resources. So we've got a lot of tired investigators. We have lots of things going on, and a third uh, call comes in. Lead investigator Mark Lightfoot is assigned to the case. Arrive at the quarry and make sure that everything's secured. There's a real danger when you have an outdoor scene of losing evidence, of evidence being contaminated. It's not just dragging something out of the water. Everything has to be done very meticulously so that there's no evidence that's lost. For almost two hours, the dive team struggles to bring the cumbersome bag onto the shore. I could see what looked like a black plastic bag. Like a heavy, thick black plastic, duct taped. A canvasy sort of thing as well that said US mail. Inside canvas sheeting or bedding, similar to what you would see as a sleeping bag cover. And inside that, a grisly sight. 
there was a body of a male, somewhere between 35 and 50 years old. White male, long dark hair, ponytail. Big Fu Manchu mustache. No identification. And had been shot behind the right ear. And then a bag has been filled with concrete garden stones. Your initial thoughts when you see something like this, this is a traditional organized crime or uh, outlaw motorcycle execution style slaying. One single shot to the head gave credence to the hit sort of scenario. Biker gangs are on the move in Niagara, infiltrating the area. We knew things were starting to heat up with two rival gangs, which right away you go, my God, you know, that can bring a lot of bloodshed. A biker or mob hit will make this case even tougher for police to solve. In that subculture can never get a lot of cooperation. If the victim was connected to crime, frontline police might recognize him. They're called to the quarry by Paul Granton from the forensic unit. I had a number of officers uh, look at the face of the deceased and they could not identify him. They hadn't seen him before. It's not only a who done it, it's a who is it. You have to answer the question of who it is before you can start to figure out who did it. The victim's fingerprints could help, but can police pull them from his waterlogged body? So that was our first piece of uh, luck. Okay, hasn't been there for months. I'm able to get a fingerprint from the body right at the scene uh, simply by applying a little bit of fingerprint powder to the thumb of the deceased and using some tape to remove the fingerprint powder. An officer takes the thumbprint to headquarters. Will it help put a name to the murdered man? His fingerprints were sent through the APHIS system, which is the automated fingerprint system in Canada. And they quickly came back as negative. No identification. No matches. The police have hit a dead end. A waterlogged body is discovered submerged in an Ontario quarry. The unidentified victim the male, 40s, dark hair, ponytail. The killing has all the hallmarks of a gangland execution. The body was wrapped in plastic and then it was weighted down by gardening bricks. Cause of death appears to be a small caliber gunshot wound behind the right ear. Investigators run the victim's fingerprints through the Canadian database but find no match. They switch gears and focus on the killer but determining that person's identity won't be easy either. They look for any clues that might have been left by the killer on the plastic body bag. Water is going to hamper any type of forensic investigation, but fingerprints can survive underwater. The tape that bound the bag might also provide prints. Whenever fingertips or part of your palm come in contact with the sticky side, uh, the tape will actually remove some of the skin layers that are on your hand. The duct tape and the uh, plastic were sent to the OPP, uh, the Ontario Provincial Police in Aurelia. While investigators wait for results that may identify the killer... We did a canvas of the area, which is good old-fashioned police work, knocking on doors and talking to people. No one had seen anything or heard anything. So it was going to be a long, tiresome, hot summer. A summer made worse by a hungry news media, including local crime reporter Grant LaFleche. It excited me as a journalist because we had a genuine mystery on our hands. We didn't know what had happened. The police didn't know what had happened. So I tried quite hard to try to get sort of into it as far as I could. But Deputy Chief Donna Moody is reluctant to release too much information for fear it could compromise the investigation. We try to find right away a small piece of evidence that only the killer themselves or someone closely connected on scene at the time of the killing would know. You know, traditionally, they call that holdback evidence. In this case, the holdback is how the victim was killed. When we first found out, we knew he was a dead guy in a bag. I didn't know how he died, and they weren't, they weren't gonna tell us. Using my own sources within the police department, I was able to find out that the victim had been shot at close range in the back of the head with a small caliber weapon. The information hits the headlines. It was really, I know, upset the investigators. I mean, they didn't say 22 caliber, but he clearly said in that article, 
Small caliber weapon shot in the head. Police are thinking it's a biker organized crime hit. Annoyed, Donna Moody hatches a plan for the media to help identify the victim rather than disrupt the investigation. At the uh, post-mortem, they photographed a side view and a front view of the deceased male, and we wanted it in the paper. Who is this person? Can you identify it? And they released to the press this morgue photo of the murder victim, just his, just his face. And in my first reaction was, OK, great, let's run it. But the higher-ups at the paper decide the picture of a corpse is too much for their readers. And so we did not run the photo. We were disappointed they didn't run it, but we, we were making progress in another area. Namely, trying to identify the body by identifying the origin of the canvas bag. The bag that he had been put in was a US military-style kit bag, so there was a thought that he might be American citizen. And if so, could police find a fingerprint match for their victim in the U.S. database? The AFIS operator for Niagara Regional Police took that fingerprint over to the United States, physically took them over and entered them into their system, and the victim was subsequently identified. Three days after his body was pulled from the water, police finally have a name for their victim, Paul Companion. Everything matched our victim, which was great, because that's number one. You can start looking for your timeline, your, what's happened in the past. Police learn Paul Campagna grew up in a Buffalo suburb. So how did he end up dead in an Ontario quarry? Once we identified him, we went to the family immediately and notified them of the, the sad discovery. Paul Campagna's sister, Ida, arrives home from work that night, unprepared for the horrifying news. I see police cars in the driveway in front of our house, and my mother is pale as a ghost sitting in the living room. Law enforcement officers tell me that my brother had been murdered. And I, I couldn't grasp what was being said to me. Who had done this? to my mother who had done this to our family. If Paul Campagna was involved in organized crime or biker gangs, he had an unlikely background. Paul went to medical school. He went to Dartmouth, which is, you know, Ivy League. He did very well. He became a medical doctor. Um, he worked in emergency rooms. He got a job with the federal government inspecting hospitals. When he decided he wanted to be a lawyer also, he went to law school. He got in at Oxford. He had such a gift, he was so bright. He had a great career and future ahead of him. Until a setback altered Paul's life and destroyed his relationship with his family. He had been in an automobile accident, had injured his back, that had left him with uh, inability to work. He had an unsuccessful operation on his back, so he was in a lot of pain. He dropped out of his career. He grew increasingly estranged from everyone, including his devoted mom. One time, my mother was in the car, and Paul passed by the car, tapped on the window, and didn't speak with her or anything, and walked away. That must have been heartbreaking for her. They said they thought he'd maybe been working at the university, helping exchange students. The grief-stricken family can provide no explanation why someone would brutally kill Paul. Investigators turned their attention back to Niagara, where his body was discovered. Now that we have the name, we do our own local records check. When we ran the name Paul Campagna, it came back as having one contact with the Niagara Regional Police Service. Previously, he'd been involved in a motor vehicle collision in the city of Niagara Falls. Police checked the car's registration, and the results are puzzling. The registered owner of the vehicle uh, is not Paul Campagna. The registered owner of the vehicle uh, is a female. The name on the registration is Hiromi, a student from Japan attending the University of Buffalo. We ran the name through Canada border and immigration checks and found that there was a lookout for her regarding her living illegally in Canada at an address on Orchard Avenue. Donna Moody assembles a team to investigate the property. When we did check the address, the vehicle was in the driveway. 
We watched the residents for a little while, no movement in and out, didn't appear to be anybody in there. The yard itself was a little overgrown, and looking over the fence, there was a, a pool, in-ground pool, that hadn't been cleaned, and the water was green and dirty. We surreptitiously did some canvassing of the neighbors. They described basically Paul Campagna pretty well from our descriptions, um, mentioned that there was a young Japanese female that lived there also. We set up surveillance to see if there was any comings and goings at the address, and there was nothing overnight. Police begin to fear the worst. The paramount question at this time was, where's Romy? Niagara police have more questions than answers in the execution-style murder of Buffalo doctor Paul Campagna. Information from border security leads them to a large home in Niagara Falls where the victim lived. The house is rented to a 27-year-old student from Japan named Hiromi, but there's no sign of her. Is she a witness? Is she a suspect? Or is she another victim? It didn't look like there was movement, no movement in the house. On our second day of doing surveillance, we decided we would attempt to get a search warrant for the residents. In addition to searching for Hiromi... We're looking for any evidence that may connect this house to the Quarry Road scene. It may very well be the crime scene, so we were very anxious. We were all waiting for the search warrant. Days after Paul Campagna's body was pulled from its watery grave, police are granted a search warrant for the house where he lived. The house was basically a, um, abandoned. We found a very pristine, extremely clean residence with very little furniture. There was one mattress that was lying on the floor, very little clothes, um, very little in the house that indicated that it was lived in. Police are grateful for what they don't find. Once inside the house, we realized there was no other victim in there. The focus of our investigation was to find her safe. We drained the pool looking for any evidence, and there was nothing there. The forensic team searches for anything that could link this house to Paul Campagna's murder. We found sheets of heavy black plastic, similar to what wrapped the body. We found duct tape. Has Hiromi suffered the same fate as Campania? Where is the Japanese female student? The search warrant included the vehicle that was parked in the driveway that was registered to her. There's no evidence of Hiromi inside, but what they discover in the car provides a surprising lead. In the trunk area, we found several bags of uh, dried marijuana leaves. There was dirt, there was the stalks of the marijuana plant. Clearly, that would indicate to us that there was cultivation going on. We didn't find any evidence of marijuana grow in the residence. Police review the home's power bills and look for high electricity consumption, the telltale sign of a marijuana grow up. The hydro records showed an inordinate amount of use earlier in the year. So we assumed that there had been a grow at one time on Orchard Avenue, but it had been moved. Where it went is as much a mystery as Hiromi's whereabouts. We did some background checks on Hiromi and found an emergency phone number from her Buffalo University records. Mark Lightfoot, the detective in charge, placed a cold call through uh, to Japan to the number he got through on the number. And I asked if it was Hiromi, and she said it was. And I quickly identified myself as a police officer in Canada in Niagara Falls. He tells her Campania has been murdered. She became very quiet, and I asked her about her relationship with Paul Campania. She said they were friends. She was uh, taking courses, and as part of her courses, she traveled around the world. He stayed at the house as the keeper of the house. Uh, she left the car there with him. She was forthright enough in saying that she had been living with him and she had rented the residence for him. And so I was quite confident it was Hiromi. She tells police that five months earlier, she found Campania was growing pot in the house and ordered it removed, which he did. And though Hiromi insists she had nothing to do with Paul Campania's murder, it certainly didn't eliminate her as a suspect or a possible witness. She seemed quite evasive with me on the phone. They notify Japanese authorities about the investigation. 
Eventually, we got information from the Japanese police that she was, in fact, out of the country according to her passport and back in Japan at the time of the murder. Police examined the Orchard Avenue phone records for the days leading up to the murder. Because they now know Hiromi had moved back to Japan, they presume all the calls were made by Paul Campagna. Search warrant is obtained in searching the records from that phone. We were following up all the records and talking to everybody who'd been phoned from the address. The majority knew the man as John. But if Campania was the one living in the house, who is this John who made countless calls from it? Police interview the people phoned from the residence. They knew very little about the man that they called John. He was very secretive. They'd met him at coffee shops or in passing through other friends and acquaintances. But he always portrayed himself as a drug-involved individual to them, somewhat involved with organized crime. He used terms of Big Tony and Sammy and different words like that to give the impression that he had some connection to the underworld. They're quite well-known names in organized crime in Niagara Falls. By showing people photos of the victim, police established that the man known as John is actually Paul Campagna. So was this former medical doctor and teacher actually connected to organized crime? And if so, had his bragging been too much for his crime bosses? Did someone from organized crime come in and kill him? The search warrant on Orchard Avenue ended up giving us more uh, questions than it did answers. Especially when investigators discover a series of mysterious notes. During the search of the house, they found several notes they were handwritten notes written to a person by the name of Matt. It's directions telling him to clean the pool, to clean the house, to do this, to cut the grass and stuff like that. They had an oppressive type tone to the note. The notes were almost like it was an employee that was being told, do this, do that, very demanding. Yeah, they were almost demeaning uh, in, in the tone. There was no Matt on the telephone records. We didn't know who Matt was. The hunt to find the killer in the mob-style slaying of Paul Campagna has police focused on one name, Matt. They've eliminated Hiromi as a suspect, the woman who rents the house where the victim lived. She was, in fact, out of the country according to her passport and back in Japan at the time of the murder. But in the house, investigators find notes ordering the unknown Matt to complete menial tasks. It's almost like Matt is a houseboy or some sort of uh, errand runner. Now we have a third concern. Where's Matt? Because he was clearly in this house. Five days after fishing Campania's body out of the quarry, Matt's their best lead. We uh, go around canvassing neighborhoods. Do you know Matt? And they all described a young male, about 20, 21 years old, short blonde hair that was doing jobs around the house, but they hadn't seen him in several weeks. Confident that the young man neighbors described is the Matt named in the notes, investigators issue a bulletin to the entire police service. Does anyone know a Matt connected to Orchard Avenue in, in Niagara Falls? As investigators struggle to locate the elusive Matt, a seemingly unrelated call comes in that will set in motion a stunning chain of events. The street crime unit's Terry Thompson, armed with a search warrant, responds to a call from a concerned Niagara landlord. He noticed some unique things about the residence. He hadn't seen the, the tenant in a couple weeks. The, the lawn was unkempt. He went in the front door uh, to check on the residence and saw some marijuana glance and backed out and uh, called the police. My first instinct when I walked in there was this is a lot bigger than the landlord really thinks it was. Throughout the McGrail Avenue house, Thompson and his team find close to 1,200 marijuana plants that are dead or dying. To me, it looked like someone had kind of taken off right away and left them for some reason. As his team examines the house, Thompson spots something that brings his search to a screeching halt. No one had started uh, dismantling the grow or any part of it because I was waiting for other people to show up before we dismantled it. So I was walking around the front living room area and that's when I saw a small box, maybe four or five books in it. When I went to lift the box, I had the edges of the, of the cardboard. The invoice flipped backwards to me. 
Shivers went down my back when I read the address. The box is addressed to Paul Campagna's home, just 15 blocks west on Orchard Avenue. Is there a link between this grow-up and Campagna? And if so, could this be the scene of his murder? I was gathering people around and telling them we got to get out of here because it might be linked. I wanted to make sure nothing was disturbed in the house. Suddenly, the name of the tenant listed on the search warrant becomes significant. When I made the application for a search warrant, the information I had from the landlord was a guy named Matthew Bowden, and then it just hit me like a brick. Oh boy, Matt, Matthew Bowden. Could the Matt that investigators are desperately searching for be the Matthew Bowden who rents this house? Now we've got a box with the address, something to do with Maryland Grow Ups, connects us to Orchard Avenue, so we're starting to connect those dots. We suspended the marijuana grow up search as we thought this house could be involved in the murder. Without that link, uh, it would have been very easy for detectives to, you know, tear down the grow operation. You're bagging things, you're moving soils, you're moving chemicals. There's, there's quite a big mess. It would have destroyed all the evidence that may be there for the homicide. Forensic lead Paul Granton takes charge of the house. There's no initial evidence that this is the murder scene. Then Granton finds two keys on the coffee table. Could they help unlock this case? At the beginning, we, or we see the set of keys. One key will open the door to Grail Avenue, but the other key, we don't know what door that's for. The forensic unit had asked me, go try these keys and see if they fit to Orchard Avenue, I, I suppose just on a whim, um, and uh, they did it opened the door there. They've connected the houses, but... Where is Matt? Where is he? Is he a victim? How do we find him? From the landlord, police obtained startling information from Matthew Bowden's rental application. One of the references when we went and looked was Hiromi and the phone number at Orchard Avenue. Another link between Matthew Bowden and Paul Campagna Police search Campania's phone records and find calls to someone with the last name Bowden in the nearby town of Dunville. It turns out to be a number for Matt's parents. And they told us, well, he's fine, he's alive. He was now at home in Dunville and was working at his two part-time jobs in, in the town of Dunville. Matt Bowden is arrested for drug cultivation and taken into custody. Two weeks after 49-year-old Paul Campagna was shot, bagged, and dumped, police still don't know who committed this horrific crime. Their only arrest is the victim's 21-year-old drug associate, Matt Bowden, who's suspected of running a Niagara grow-up. They arrested him for the charges of cultivation of marijuana in relation to the McGrail Avenue search warrant. In addition to running the grow up, it seems that Bowden was also tasked with taking care of Paul Campagna's nearby residence. He was a very quiet, um, intelligent young man and seemed to be way over his head in this whole situation. When I saw him, it was quite shocking to me, really, because I said he looked like the boy living next door. You know, young, 21 years old. While in custody, Bowden appears remorseful and owns up to his role in the drug operation. He admits that he was the renter of the residence and that he was doing a, a marijuana grow there, and he admits to being friends with Paul Campagna. Bowden claims he purchased the marijuana plants through an acquaintance, but Campagna confronted him and insisted the plants belonged to him. And the person in the town that had sold them to him had no business doing that. They were his plants, and he wanted them back. He said that Mr. Campagna portrayed himself as being a member of organized crime and that he had some very strong connections. A situation of threatening and, and him not being really experienced enough to know what to do. According to Mr. Bowden, he was doing the, the grow and all the errands to try and pay off between three and $5,000 in debt to him. Could Matt Bowden have killed Campagna over his debt for the marijuana plants? He seemed shocked that he was dead. He said he hadn't seen him in a while and had nothing to do with his death. I owed the guy, he was threatening me, and I was trying to, to pay this off, but in no way that I had any involvement in his death. 
The next day, Matt Bowden is fingerprinted for the drug possession and trafficking charges and released to appear in court later. Desperate for a new lead and a new suspect, police return to the McGrail Avenue home. We're very, very hopeful we were going to find the scene of the crime. As the forensic team examines the house, they find crucial evidence that links it to the murder of Paul Campagna. Inside the house, we did find the dark plastic and the uh, duct tape. And we found rolls of clear packing tape that was similar to the packing tape that wrapped the body. The house on McGrail Avenue is now tied into the dump scene on Quarry Road. But police have no proof this is the scene of the murder until they come across a gruesome cover-up. There was a large piece uh, of carpeting that was cut out of the carpet in that home and had been partially covered up by a chair. Underneath the chair was a clear plastic carpet runner. When we removed the carpet runner, we could see that a section of the carpet had been uh, removed. When we looked at the floor underneath, we could see some dark staining. It was blood. It's been treated with some sort of cleaning fluid. That indicated to me there was attempts to clean up a, a bloody scene and that means that uh, somebody died there. Forensics comes back and says that the blood is about 99% positive that it's Paul Campania's. Proof this living room is the scene of the execution, but who is the murderer? And it certainly increases the probability that Matt Bowden knows much more than what he has told us. But it's still a huge leap to cold-blooded murder. Police learn as much as they can about Matt Bowden from his friends and teachers. He's a very gifted student, a very bright student. Every teacher that we talked to said he was a pleasure to have in the class. His friends said that they had been to the house. They had seen the marijuana grow. A number of them said that they had seen Mr. Campania and that he, uh, he treated Mr. Bowden very badly and that he, he was very bossy and aggressive towards him. Police ask his friends for their fingerprints, which they voluntarily submit. Paul Granton wants them to determine who's been in the home where Campania was killed. Anyone that was in that house could be involved in the homicide. Now, almost three months after the victim was found, lab results from the material that wrapped his body deliver astounding news. Well, when we got the results back, what they found on the plastic was that there was um, handling from some sort of a gloved hand. But more importantly, there was 10 beautiful fingerprints that were located on the, uh, on the sticky side of the duct tape. Those fingerprints belong to Matthew Bowden. Suddenly, the 21-year-old with the innocent looks is looking guilty. That was a big turning point in the investigation. Blood evidence has proven Paul Campania was executed in the grow-up house rented by his young accomplice, Matthew Bowden. Matt Bowden was certainly admitting his involvement with Paul Campania, but in no way that I had any involvement in his death. Then forensic lead Paul Granton receives remarkable news from the crime lab. They found prints on the tape that bound the victim. On the duct tape, there was actually 10 fingerprints, and those fingerprints were identified to Matthew Bowden. That was a big turning point in the investigation. It was obvious that Matt had involvement in Paul Campania's death, but uh, it didn't tell us uh, who actually pulled the trigger. Especially when new evidence has police questioning whether Matt Bowden is, in fact, their killer. When we were continuing the search of the house, we found a receipt dated May 28th, which had Mr. Bowden's fingerprints on it. The receipt is for a six pack of beer, dated the same day police believe Campania was killed. There was no fridge in the house, so we assumed that the beer had been purchased that day and drank that day. Police find the empty beer cans in the house. From one, they lift a fingerprint. It doesn't belong to Bowden or the victim. The fingerprint on the beer can opened up the possibility that somebody else was present at the time of the homicide. And uh, it was quite possible that he could be the, the person responsible. Police compare this print to prints obtained from Bowden's friends. 
comes back with a fingerprint that's, that's later identified to be an acquaintance of Matt Bowden's. Now police have two potential killers. We certainly had reasonable and probable grounds to go locate Matt and arrest him. I arrested him in Dunville. He was just leaving his house to go to work. They also arrest his longtime friend whose fingerprint is on the beer can. Investigators must find out who actually pulled the trigger. Who do you believe and who do you not believe? But Matt's not talking. He'd received some strict instruction from his lawyer that if he was arrested, he was to say absolutely nothing to the police regarding the homicide, and that's what he did. He said nothing. But in another room, Matt's friend says plenty. He makes a deal and reveals what happened. He denied any involvement in the, the execution-style slaying, but admitted if he did not get charged with anything that he was involved in helping to move the body. He admits that Matthew Bowden had called him earlier and to say that, you know, uh, Paul Compagni was dead and he needed help. The friend said that he showed up at the house. He had to be convinced to help, but he ended up showing up at the house. Matthew was wrapping the body. He came in, he assisted him, obviously had one of the cans of beer. Mr. Bowden had rented a U-Haul for the day and drove to the quarry and dumped him over the side. But had Matt killed Paul Campagna, or had he been left to clean up someone else's mess? Police confront Matt with his friend's account of what happened. We went back to Matt and we showed him the interview that we just conducted with his friend and Matt still didn't say anything about the, the homicide. To build their case, police need to find the weapon used to kill Paul Campagna. If the young man had committed the murder, where did he get the gun? Investigators re-interview Matt's friends, then hear a startling story from one of Matt's acquaintances. She recalled overhearing a telephone call between Matt Bowden and her boyfriend, uh, where Matt had asked him if he could supply him with a gun. And then finally, two of Mr. Bowden's associates admitted that he had asked them for a gun for protection. What else can you tell me about the gun? I said, I could help him out with that, and I had brought it to him. What kind of gun was it? It was a 22. The same size bullet used to kill Paul Campagna. That was part of the whole back evidence. Uh, it was, in fact, a 22 caliber firearm that was used to kill him. Although the search of the McGrail Avenue house has turned up no firearm, police had found some incriminating items. One of them was a scope for a uh, rifle. There were receipts from U-Haul uh, rentals. There was an index card from the library. And on the back were some writings that we determined to be how to make a homemade silencer. But are they Matt's? Fingerprints are pulled from the index cards and matched to Matt. That coupled with all of the forensic evidence, we certainly had reasonable and probable grounds to believe that Matthew was the killer in this homicide. Police have arrested 21-year-old Matt Bowden for the first-degree murder of Paul Campagna. They've linked him to the homicide with overwhelming forensic evidence, including his 10 fingerprints on the tape wrapped around the murder victim. He had left this bungled trail of evidence behind him. Bowden says he owed thousands of dollars to Campagna for marijuana plants. And he was working off his debt to Paul Campagna by doing odd jobs, helping him tend to plants, helping him to do certain things in the house. But when Bowden tried to flee the situation, he claims his family was at risk. He said that Mr. Campagna threatened him, threatened his brother, threatened his family, and in fact was picking up the phone saying he was calling someone to kill his family, and that's when he, he, uh, he shot him. Matt Bowden has finally confessed. He wasn't an accomplice to Paul Campagna's death. He pulled the trigger. And what of Matt's claim that Campagna had threatened to get one of his crime world connections to slaughter Bowden's family? There were names being thrown around that I recognized that if it was true, he would have certain backing from members of organized crime. But was Campagna bluffing just to keep Matt under his control? Donna Moody asks her colleagues in intelligence to verify Campagna's claim. Nobody knew him in that world. 
There was no connection to Paul Compagna in that world. And there's lots of ways to check that connection out, and there was no connection. But police believe Paul Campagna isn't the only one who's been telling lies. They doubt Matt or his family were in any danger from Campagna. Even Matt Bowden's lawyer has trouble believing his client's version of events. I had difficulty in dealing with the explanation that the deceased had threatened his family and his brother, and he couldn't extricate himself from this. I had very little direct evidence of the alleged misconduct by the deceased. Very little. The victim's family rejects Bowden's explanation as well. It's not self-defense when the other guy doesn't have a gun. And if it's self-defense, why would you go through that trouble to get rid of the body to hide the crime? Looking at the trajectory of the bullet, Paul was probably asleep when he was shot. Paul was laying there defenseless and he put the gun behind his ear and pulled the trigger he did not need to kill my brother Paul was probably growing marijuana to fund his law school so what was Bowden's motive for killing Campania there are some witness statements that indicate that Matthew had said, I'm going to rip him off for the grow up. It's possible that he uh, just wanted to cut Paul Capani out of it. Nobody knew what happened in that house that night. No one but Matthew Bowden, my brother. Police learned that after the murder, Matt Bowden rented a truck to remove the plants. The first time the truck broke down, the next time, police were at the house. Whatever the motive, the evidence proves Bowden pulled the trigger. That was one of the huge jumps that we had to make, was, was putting this young 21-year-old, never been in trouble with the police kid, into a possible cold-blooded murder scene. Bowden pleads to second-degree murder and is handed a life sentence with no chance of parole for 10 years. It's certainly a tragedy all around for everyone involved. Mr. Campagna was a, a gifted, brilliant man who just didn't find his way in life. And Mr. Bowden was 21 years old with his whole life ahead of him. I really did believe it to be some type of organized crime biker. This is the start of the violence coming to our area. And it turned out to be totally opposite from that.